and it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Stefania Gori. And uh, well, I've known I've known Stefania for a number of years now, uh, and had the great pleasure of collaborating with her in um, particle physics. Um, Stefania uh, was born in a small town in Tuscany, and uh, in Italy, and uh, came to North America in 2010 uh, after receiving her PhD in Munich. Um, and she then had two postdoctoral positions, first in the University of Chicago and then at the Perimeter Institute uh, uh, for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Canada. And since 2016, she has been a member of the faculty of the University of Cincinnati. Um, and she recently received a very prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award. Um, Stefania has worked in a number of areas in particle physics, including Higgs physics, the physics of dark matter, what we call flavor physics and neutrino physics. Um, and uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, know that the Higgs boson, uh, the missing piece of the standard model of particle physics, was discovered to, to great fanfare in 2012. Uh, since then, the experimental particle physicists at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, have been extremely busy collecting lots of data. Uh, they have many um, Higgs bosons now in their data samples, and they can study its properties. And so far, it looks kind of like the Higgs boson that was predicted many, many years ago by the theorists. But Stefani is interested in uh, what lies beyond that. Uh, maybe we're getting a little bit too smug. And in fact, um, she has led, been one of the leaders of an international team of theorists who have asked very pointed questions to the experimentalists. What, what if the Higgs boson does certain things that you're not expecting. Um, you better look out for, for different possibilities than what you've been focusing on. And that's been some very exciting work, and she's convinced a lot of her experimental colleagues that they ought to take another look. So you'll be hearing, I'm sure, about this and a, a lot more uh, aspects of the secret life of the Higgs boson. Welcome, Stefania. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Very good. So thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be here discussing with you the secret life of the Higgs boson. Uh, so first of all, uh, I want also to uh, present a little bit myself. I'm Stefania. I'm a theoretical particle physicist. Uh, you should not be scared about this uh, name. So I work on theories. Uh, so I do a lot of calculations for uh, part particle physics. Uh, but actually, also, as Howie was mentioning, I also work uh, quite closely together with experimentalists. So experimentalists uh, doing measurements, uh, doing experiments uh, at um, completely different experiments uh, worldwide, both in the US and uh, in other places like at CERN in Switzerland. And, uh, and actually, for particle physics, you can uh, sort of uh, group uh, um, put together researchers uh, probably in three different categories. There are theories, um, more or less abstract, uh, you know, working out theories, uh, uh, writing down even completely different theories. Um, and uh, then there are experimentalists that are more concrete, you know, building experiments, uh, doing measurements, uh, collecting data, analyzing data. And then there is this uh, field in the middle that is called phenomenology. What does a phenomenologist do? Um, a phenomenologist is somewhere in between uh, theorists and experimentalists. Uh, in the sense that a phenomenologist study 
theories for uh, particle physics, but with the, uh, with the aim of extracting phenomena. So with the aim of extracting what these theories are telling us, what they are predicting, and how we could test these theories in, uh, in our experiments. So typically phenomenologists, as actually myself, are suggesting to experimentalists new measurements, and then we hope that this, uh, the experimentalists will pick up us on uh, our measurements and uh, will tell us something, hopefully something exciting. Okay? Um, so I'm participating here um, uh, at a workshop, to a workshop at the Aspen Center for Physics. Uh, this is already my third week. It's not the first time I come in Aspen and it's really exciting. We have uh, a lot of theorists, phenomenologists and also experimentalists and there have been a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of new ideas. So this is really an exciting, exciting environment to work. So having said this, since this talk is going to be about uh, particle physics, let me first mention what particle physics does. So the final aim of particle physics is to understand how the universe works at the most fundamental level. Okay? So we are asking what are the tiniest components of nature and how they work, how they behave, and how they form our universe. Okay? This can seem a little bit abstract, and in fact we will see that elementary particles cannot really be seen with our naked eye, they are super, super tiny. But actually we also have to keep in mind that these ideas that we have for particle physics, or in general for theoretical physics, can be used in the future for applications for new technologies. Here I'd like to report two examples that I think are super, super interesting. One is the World Wide Web. WWW. So the WWW was actually invented at CERN, at this laboratory that uh, I will introduce to you uh, later, in the, say, early 90s, with the idea of facilitating the communication between scientists. Okay? Um, this was really a need uh, you know, to, uh, to com for communicating for, for scientists uh, all around the world. And actually, we know that now the, the WWW is uh, used uh, really by everybody, uh, not only by scientists. Another interesting example, since we'll speak a lot about the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC at CERN, uh, there is a lot of technology that is going uh, in the LHC. One of the technologies is called the synchrotron. And actually, this synchrotron has been also used recently for proton beam therapy machines for treating cancer. So this is an amazing, in my opinion, development that has been used first for particle physics and then for uh, completely different applications. Okay? So this is just uh, my slide of introduction of particle physics. Uh, then let me introduce you also our main characters for this, uh, say, 50 minutes of talk. So here are our, our particles. Okay? I'm putting just some of them, not all. Uh, we have, for example, here we have a our electron, here we have our photon, some quarks. Actually, if you are curious, uh, in this website, uh, so this website is selling these uh, soft toys. So each particle has a soft toy. Um, but um, we won't speak only about particles. We'll also speak a lot about tools. So what are our machines? What are our experiments? And our focus um, will be on the Large Hadron Collider or the LHC. This, as we'll see, is our huge tool. This is actually the biggest experiment that has ever been built for particle physics. But also, we have not to think uh, about uh, you know, a one-to-one -one connection between particle physics and the Large Hadron Collider. We have a lot of information also directly coming from the sky for particle physics. So if you, stu if you study uh, very massive objects in the sky, like uh, galaxies or clusters of galaxies, you can get information on these uh, tiny particles, as you, as you will see. Okay? And if you're curious, uh, okay, it's not too bright, but this is the Milky Way as seen from Aspen, this is the gondola of Aspen. Okay? Um, so, what is the topic? What we'll try to understand in this talk uh, is simply this cartoon here. Now, this cartoon for now has no meaning, but we'll try to understand it uh, quite a bit. So we we'll see in chapter one, that is summarized by this cartoon, chapter one is summarizing uh, what we know about particle physics uh, now, in 2017. Okay? Then um, I will argue 
that we strongly believe that this is not a full story for our universe, <coughs> but there is something that we are missing, something that we don't know. And we see that uh, one of the uh, uh, main points will be dark matter. We learn that we don't know much about dark matter. And in the third chapter, we'll give you some prescriptions, or some ideas that can tell us how we can uh, learn about dark matter in the coming years, or in the coming decades for particle physics. Okay? So that's uh, my plan for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So let me start with uh, chapter one. So what do we know about particle physics? <laughs> so particle physics, um, as I already said, is studying the fundamental constituents of nature, right? But then let's apply this, uh, this definition and let's see where we go. So if we apply this definition, probably our first uh, particle physicist was Empedocles, even before Christ, because Empedocles um, was thinking about nature as formed by air, earth, water, and fire, right? So these were the four uh, constituents of nature, or as Empedocles was calling the roots of nature. And the idea was that these roots were indivisible. So these were the fundamental constituents of nature. Of course, since then, fortunately, you know, we have done a lot of progress. And actually, in the last uh, three centuries, uh, we have understood that we have uh, very, very small elements that, are const that uh, constitute uh, nature. In the beginning of the 18th century, we understood that atoms, uh, atoms uh, were the smallest components. Uh, very, very small, something at the level of 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. But actually, the story uh, didn't stop here, because at the beginning of the 20th century, with Thomson, we discovered the electron. The electron was a constituent of the atom, and therefore, we understood that the atom was not fundamental. Okay? And uh, also, we discovered that in the atom, we had these uh, nuclei, also composed by nucleons, uh, protons, and, uh, and neutrons. And more recently, in the last century or so, we discovered that protons and neutrons are composed, and they are composed by what we call quarks. Okay? So we are at this point here where we have electrons and quarks, and our belief is that these are elementary, truly elementary particles. So you cannot uh, break them apart even further. As a matter of fact, uh, what is quite uh, impressive for, for what we will see later, is that these particles are basically pointless. So they, they are so small, you cannot really see them. They don't have really a dimension. Okay? Now, um, we don't have only the electron and the quarks, but we have many, many particles. This is all the summary of all particles we know of. Okay? What is interesting of this, uh, of this picture taken from The Economist uh, is that each uh, particle has two years associated, as you see. So this is uh, the, the year. Um, so what does it mean? So we see that, uh, first of all, we need some theorists like me. This is thinking about uh, the existence of a new particle. And then afterwards, we can have the, the experimental discovery. Okay? Look, for example, this Higgs boson that has been the last particle that we have discovered. The Higgs boson was theorized in 1964, and then it was only discovered in 2012, so a lot, a lot of years afterwards. Of course, you should not think about particle physics as a field where it takes a long time between you know, the theory and the experiment, because a lot of times we had also complete surprises. The, example, the famous example is the example of the muon. The muon was really discovered uh, by chance. So there was no theorist uh, telling us that maybe there is a muon, and then it was discovered. And the muon is uh, basically nothing other than uh, the heavy brother of the electron. So it has the same properties as uh, an electron, but it's heavier. Okay? Um, so now that we have all these particles, uh, we would like to understand their properties, how to classify these particles. So in some sense, uh, we would like to do a similar thing as uh, Mendeleev did in 1869, right? Because Mendeleev was uh, organizing the several atoms, the several elements, according uh, to their atomic number, so according to their number of protons. And what he observed was that uh, there was some uh, periodicity in the sense that uh, several elements were behaving similarly, right? For example, here in green, we know that we have noble gases that are not so much reactive. So how do we do a periodic table for, uh, instead of chemists, for physicists? And 
And uh, this is the most updated uh, uh, physicist periodic table, containing all the particles that we have seen uh, a couple of slides ago. And actually, the same uh, color corresponds to particles that behave similarly. As I said already, you have an electron and the uh, heavy brother of the electron that is the muon, or you have an up quark and the heavy brother of the up quark that is a charm, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, what we call in the external layer here, matter fields. So this is what uh, really matter is made of. Internally here, we have what we call force carriers. Um, so just to understand a little bit what they are, we are kind of familiar with photons. Photons are the responsible of the electromagnetism that we experience in uh, everyday life. But then we have also some particles that are relatively similar. Um, these are called the gluons that are carried, carrying a different force, the so-called strong force. And then finally, we have the W and the Z boson carrying uh, what we call the weak force. Okay? And then finally, here in the center, and we under will understand that actually it has to be really in the center, we have our Higgs boson. Okay? Now, let's try to be a little bit more concrete, right? So let's take some of these particles and let's try to build a table. How do we build a table? So certainly we have to take some uh, uh, electrons because we know that electrons uh, are orbiting around the atom. Then we need to build protons and neutrons, so we'll need some uh, up and down quarks, as we see here. We need to find some photons because photons are responsible of this interaction between electrons and uh, protons. But then finally, we, we see that we need also another element here, another particle, and the particle is the gluon. Actually, the gluon is uh, uh, responsible of keeping together protons and neutrons, okay? Otherwise, um, Simply, the up and down quarks would just fly around. They would not uh, stick together. Okay? So now that we have learned uh, how to build a table, we see that uh, you know, we have a lot of redundancy. In principle, we don't really need the muon, right? uh, or we don't need the charm, and so on and so forth. Right? But in particular, we see that uh, so far, we have not really mentioned the Higgs boson. So you might think, OK, this, uh, this talk is going to be about the Higgs boson. Why do we care? Right? So I'm sure that if you ask to any particle physicist, he or she will tell you that the Higgs boson has been the most wanted particle. Uh, theorized 1964, experimental searches started in the 90s. We discovered in 2012. Okay. Now, with the Higgs boson, we can build our table. Let's see what happens without the Higgs boson. Okay. Without the Higgs boson, this will happen. So why so? The reason is that we, we say that the Higgs boson is responsible of giving mass to the elementary particles. Let's see a little bit how it works. We can think about the Higgs field <coughs> as uh, something that is everywhere, everywhere in this room, everywhere on this floor. So basically what we can do is to associate a number to each point of the floor. And this is the number that is telling us how much Higgs field we have uh, in this specific point. Okay? If we do the average uh, all around, we see that we get a number that is different from zero, that is telling us that basically the Higgs field is everywhere. Now we can do the following experiment. We can take some quarks, for example, an up quark or a top quark. A top quark is a heavy up quark. We throw these uh, two quarks on our floor. And we see that actually both of them will interact with the Higgs boson, with the Higgs field that we have everywhere. And because of this interaction, what will happen is that these uh, quarks will slow down. You can think about simply you know, bouncing around in the Higgs field and then slowing down uh, slower or faster. Okay? Now, the up quark will slow down uh, um, much less than the top quark. And this is telling us that uh, actually the up quark has uh, a much smaller mass than the top quark. Okay? So basically, this cartoon should tell us that because of the interaction of all of the several elementary particles with the Higgs boson, we are producing the mass, the mass of these elementary particles. Okay? But then we can go back to our atom. And what we see is that actually if uh, the electron uh, interacts with the Higgs, uh, then it can have a mass, as we know that it has a mass, and then uh, it will be uh, orbiting around here. 
If the electron doesn't have a mass, so if there was no Higgs boson, then the electron, uh, as we know, will just uh, fly away. That's why basically atoms could not stick together, we could not really build any table, we would not exist. Okay? That's why, uh, theoretically, and uh, you know, in our application, looking at nature, we know that we really needed uh, our Higgs boson. That's why the Higgs boson was so essential. Okay? Now, since I argued that it took us quite a bit of time to, um, to discover this Higgs boson, we would like to understand why. And we would like to understand how this discovery was possible. Now, this discovery was possible at the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, at CERN. So this is a super big machine that has been built at the border between Switzerland and France. So this is a bird eye view of the, of, the, of the machine. So this is a very big tunnel that is underground. It's something like 100 meters underground. Uh, this is pretty big, so the uh, diameter is nine kilometers. You can put it in miles, uh, it's something like 17 miles of circumference, okay? So it's pretty big. And, um, and actually what we are doing in this tunnel that is underground is to ac accelerate protons, okay? So we have many, many protons that are accelerated, and actually we know pretty well uh, the, the motion of this proton, so we know how to bend protons, and we know that the protons will collide basically only in four exact points. That are the points where we put our experiment, because we would like to understand what happens our after proton-proton collisions, right? And these are our big experiments. We have the CMS experiment, uh, ATLAS, LHCB, and ALICE. And what is quite amazing, in my opinion, with these experiments uh, is that uh, these are really huge collaborations that are completely international. So, for example, um, um, for the ATLAS collaboration, we have something like 3,000 scientists, uh, and they are representing something like 40 different countries uh, and 180 different uh, universities, cities, or laboratories. So this is a, a very international effort uh, that we have done in order to understand better nature and to understand better particle physics. Okay. Now, we would like to see a little bit better how to accelerate protons and what happens afterwards, because our aim now is to understand how we were able to discover the Higgs boson, right? So we can say that everything starts with a bottle. Let's see a little bit why. And this is not a story, this is true, right? So what we have at, uh, at LHC is a bottle, a small bottle, of hydrogen. Okay. So we start with hydrogen. We put electric fields in such a way to separate protons and electrons. In such a way that now we can start with some, uh, some protons here, okay? And then, uh, so this is the path of our protons till they're here. And protons are more and more accelerated uh, because the idea is that we want to reach very, very, very high energies, okay? And actually, as we see here, the energy of this proton beam is something like, uh, as we say, 7 TeV. And this is basically something like 7,000 time, uh, times uh, bigger than the mass of the proton itself. So it's, this is a huge energy that uh, we are reaching inside this uh, big tunnel of the LHC. Okay? So let's see, indeed, uh, how fast uh, these protons can, uh, can run inside this tunnel. Einstein is telling us that we cannot uh, you know, pass, we cannot overcome the speed of light. So let's see how close we can get to the speed of light. right? So we start here with something like uh, 0.3 speed of light, uh, 0.921, getting closer, getting even closer. Maybe now we can get there. Let's see what happens inside the Large Hadron Collider. So here we are injected in the LHC, almost there. Um, now let's see, now proton-proton collisions are happening inside one of the experiment atlas, and then we see what happens. So let's try to understand this picture here, okay, for a moment. So this is another vision of uh, one of the proton-proton collisions, okay? What is remarkable of a picture like this is that each of the lines here correspond to one elementary particle. So I find this truly remarkable because we have learned that elementary particles uh, do not really have a dimension, okay? But actually we have a machine, uh, such a, an amazing camera, they can tell us uh, where these particles are. And here, for example, if you're curious, these uh, two red lines are, for example, muons. Here in blue, you find electrons, and in yellow, you, you find some quarks. 
So this, in my opinion, is really amazing that uh, we have such a machine. The other amazing thing is that uh, since we have protons uh, that have such a large energy, we can take this equation of Einstein, E equal, e equal to mc squared, and effectively what we can do uh, is to produce particles that are much more massive than a proton, right? Because simply what we need to do is to convert uh, the energy of the protons into mass, right? So we might have a chance, uh, using this uh, super big energy, to produce something that is quite uh, uh, massive, like a Higgs boson. And this is actually what happens, OK? But then you might have a question, OK, we have a picture like this. What do we do with it? And the answer is uh, completely nothing. <laughs> and uh, why so? The reason is that we need uh, many, many millions of these pictures, OK? Um, as an analogy, you can think about, uh, you know, collecting pictures of a nice vacation that you had uh, with your family a few months ago. Maybe you went somewhere nice on the west coast, so you have a lot of pictures on mountains, lakes, ocean, okay? And you want to collect these pictures according to the number of people. So zero people, landscapes. One person, maybe you have some selfies here and there. You have two, three, four people four members and the members of your family, OK? But then if you collect a number of people in each picture, it can be that you have also pictures like this with four people that are just passing by, right? That are not belonging to your family. This is what I would call some imposters, OK? These are not uh, members of your family. But then if you have many, many of these pictures, uh, what you can do is a diagram like this, right? So this is a diagram that is telling you how many pictures as a function of the number of people in each picture, OK? So you have uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. And you can divide depending on if the people are people of your family in red or people that are just passing by, OK? But then why this is, um, you know, telling us that uh, we need many pictures at LHC? The reason is that, uh, you know, if you had just one picture of your family, you could not see, see this uh, feature here in red that is telling you that you are making pictures of your family, right? So you need many of these pictures, otherwise you would not see this, uh, what I would call a bump in your data, right? And similar is what happens uh, at LHC. So at LHC, we need uh, many, many, many of these pictures. Now, pictures of Higgs events instead of your family. And um, so let's see what uh, this plot is. This is a relatively busy plot, but let me uh, try to discuss a bit with you some, picture, some features of this plot. So this is, um, first of all, is very interesting plot because this is a plot that has been used to argue that we had the, the Higgs boson discovery, OK, back in 2012. Now, this is, uh, again, the number of events as the number of pictures of family, OK, as a function of the mass of the Higgs boson. Actually, the mass of the Higgs boson was unknown before of the Higgs boson discovery. Okay? We didn't know about it. Um, actually, what we know is that the Higgs boson is a very interesting particle that even if you are able to produce at a large hadron collider, it will decay super, super quickly. So it will decay, it will give rise to different particles, for example, two Z bosons, different particles uh, um, of the standard model. And this decay is super, super quick, something like 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So it's immediate, OK? And then basically, we can look for this uh, product of decays and then uh, make a plot like this uh, of events versus uh, the mass of the Higgs boson. So let's see what happens. What we can do is to think about switching on the LHC. So we go back uh, in 2010 when we started to collect events at LHC. Let's see what happens. So these are events as a function of mass. You see that you don't see anything in data. So these are data, right? Still nothing. Events are being collected and collected. You don't see really much, because here in blue are just uh, the so-called imposters. So we don't, really we don't really care about them. But then we see that there is something growing here, something in red. So events are more and more accumulating uh, here, you see? And the more this bump is evident, uh, and the more we, that we can claim that we had this discovery of a new particle. Now, it's nice that uh, you can see by eye that we have some feature, what we would call a bump in data. 
that is telling us that we have really a new particle. Okay? Now, that, uh, now that we have discovered, we have to celebrate. <laughs> and uh, actually, the, the discovery of the Higgs boson was announced on July the 4th, 2012, at CERN in the morning between 9 and 11 uh, a.m. This was not really a good time for American scientists because this was really in the middle of the night. Too bad. Okay, some, some reason to celebrate and to have some party late at night, as we see here and here. Um, there were many people also actually gathering at several uh, institutes and laboratories. For example, here, there are people at uh, the Fermilab laboratory that is a lab national lab uh, close to Chicago. Somebody even came in pyjama. <laughs> um, but then, uh, you know, not just American scientists, there were scientists worldwide celebrating. Uh, for example, here, this is a picture taken in Melbourne. In Melbourne, there was one of the main uh, uh, particle physics, physics uh, conferences back in uh, July 2012. And of course, also, yeah, actually, it's interesting that also many people gathered here in Aspen, uh, again, in the middle of the night. Okay. So, uh, this was an amazing discovery, and uh, so the question now is to understand if uh, there is something beyond this, okay? Because uh, now we know how to produce masses for the particles, uh, we're very happy. We think, okay, nature is uh, maybe just this, just this cartoon. Particle physicists maybe will, would tell you that this is a simple picture. Uh, you can also write down the equation uh, for all of this, and uh, this is uh, our simple picture. Um, it's very clear. Uh, you can also actually condense it on a cup. This is a cup that uh, you can actually uh, buy it at CERN. Very interesting. Uh, but then, uh, indeed, are there reasons for us to go beyond what we have discovered? And, uh, and the answer is uh, yes, we have many open questions. Many things that we don't understand uh, using uh, this simple cartoon. So, as I will argue, we have both unanswered questions uh, and uh, actually hints from data. Unanswered questions can be quite interesting for theorists, uh, are more complicated to understand if you want. These hints are really amazing, and this, is, uh, this will be our focus. Okay? But uh, let me first uh, mention uh, what are theoretically some of the unanswered questions uh, of this cartoon. Okay? So, one unanswered question that we have uh, is the origin of mass of the Higgs boson itself. Let's uh, try to understand this uh, little bit busy slide, okay? So what I'm doing here is to collect uh, the several uh, pieces of nature, for example, Earth uh, and the person, the atom, protons. Here we have our Higgs boson in a logarithmic scale. So what it in this means is that uh, if we are here and we see two marks, that means that, for example, the Higgs boson uh, is something like uh, two orders of magnitude, so a factor of 100, uh, heavier than uh, the proton. Okay? This is uh, all what this means. Okay? Okay. And then we are placing everybody here, so the atom, the person, and so on and so forth. But then we see that uh, we have uh, some other scale uh, that we are not really familiar with, uh, that is the so-called uh, quantum gravity scale that is really, really far away from the scale of the Higgs boson. Okay? So we see here that we have many, many marks in between. Okay? Now, this quantum gravity scale uh, has been studied a lot by theorists as uh, Hawking, and this is uh, the scale that corresponds uh, to the scale of black holes. Okay? But actually, theoretically, we know that uh, this scale uh, is connected to the scale of the Higgs boson. So we can use this uh, very interesting theory, this is quantum mechanics, uh, to compute uh, the Higgs boson mass. Now we know that it's 125 GeV from the experiment. We know that it's 125 times heavier than the proton. But what does uh, our theory tell us? Okay. Our theory, so the prediction for this mass, is telling us that we have a piece that is uh, close to this quantum gravity scale, so this huge number. And then we have another piece that we see here, what we call M classical. That is, in principle, a free parameter of our theory. So it can be just some random number. Okay? But then you see, uh, so we need, of course, our theories cannot uh, need to be related to nature. So we need to predict this 125. And to predict this uh, small number, we need uh, a really huge cancellation of numbers. 
So this is something that the theorists really don't like, because they, we think that there must be something hidden in this uh, coincidence. Otherwise, it's such a you know, precise coincidence. You have so many digits uh, they have to cancel in such a way to get this 125. So maybe we are missing something. Maybe our way of thinking to this uh, mass of the Higgs boson is a wrong way of thinking about it. But something should be probably hidden here. Now you might wonder, OK, this can be simply coincidence, right? Uh, why do we care? We can uh, you know, put these numbers to be almost equal and predict 125. We are done. We are good. We are happy. Maybe in nature, there are other of these type of coincidences. But actually, it's very hard to find a coincidence like that. So let me make an example. So we are very excited. In four days, we'll have a total solar eclipse. An eclipse that will uh, you know, cross the US. Unfortunately, it won't be total in Aspen, so we have to drive uh, maybe to Wyoming or so to see it total. OK? Still, it's very, very exciting. So the moon will be in the middle between uh, the sun and us. So the sun will be shadowed by the presence of the moon. Okay? Now, why this phenomenon, this very spectacular phenomenon, happens? One, some of the reasons uh, um, are coming from the fact that there is this nice cancellation of numbers, actually. So basically, the moon is 400 times closer to us than the sun. And at the same time, the sun is something like 400 times bigger than the moon. So we are lucky that we can see total and also annular solar eclipses because of this uh, sort of cancellation of numbers. Um, actually, you can see that the numbers are not really exact. Uh, so it's more or less 400, uh, say, plus minus a 5%. So there is some error on this. But still, you see, it's uh, a 5%, 0.05. So let's compare our solar eclipse to our problem with the Higgs boson mass. Instead of this 0.05, this is what we would need in terms of cancellation of equal, equal numbers. So that's why we really feel that there is something really hidden here. OK. Now, to conclude uh, this uh, chapter, before really entering in the more exciting part of the talk, what we want to say is that uh, we are um, incredibly amazed that we, are, we have been able to discover this uh, last uh, missing ingredient of the standard model, that is uh, the Higgs boson. And uh, now we have a model that is the standard model of particle physics uh, that works more or less well in the sense that it uh, can describe uh, phenomena of nature in a good way, if you want, uh, more or less. So this is really amazing. Okay? And, uh, but at the same time, we really don't like this. <laughs> okay? So this is actually not only a matter of taste, uh, of numbers. We have also, as we'll see now, something that we really don't know and that experiments are telling us that uh, is not included in this uh, standard model. So the first hints uh, that we are missing something uh, um, came from gravity. Uh, so gravity, so so far I really didn't mention gravity, if you want. Um, gravity. Usually, particle physicists do not think too much about gravity, because particles are so small, who cares about gravity? <laughs> um, but actually, there is a really important connection uh, with, between particle physics and astronomy. And this was, um, so first in 1933, the astronomer Fritz Zwicky uh, was observing the motion of a cluster of galaxies. So cluster of galaxies, um, are a set of many, many galaxies, uh, something like hundreds or thousands of galaxies, that are kept together by gravity. Okay? And then what we can do, as uh, Zwicky did, uh, was to study the motion of all these galaxies. Now, the motion, of course, uh, the velocity of these galaxies, will depend uh, on the amount of matter that is uh, uh, contained uh, inside in the galaxy. Similarly to the motion of Earth uh, around the sun, we know that uh, you know, should depend on the mass of the sun. What he discovered uh, was this, uh, that these galaxies were moving too fast, if compared to what we would have expected uh, knowing the mass of this uh, uh, cluster of galaxies. So this was totally unexpected. Uh, and similarly, in the 70s, in 1970, uh, Vera Rubin was uh, studying the motion of Andromeda galaxy. 
So Andromeda galaxy is probably the brightest uh, galaxy in the sky. You can see even uh, with the uh, naked eye if you don't have too much light pollution. And you can study the motion of the stars in this uh, spiral galaxy and the velocity of these stars. And again, what she found was that the stars were moving, the outer stars were moving too quickly. Okay? So maybe the answer to this enigma was that we were missing some mass. Having more mass uh, that gravitates will induce uh, some uh, uh, faster rotation of uh, stars or galaxies. And that's why already in 1933, Fritz Zwicky told us uh, that maybe we had some uh, dunkel materie or dark matter. Now, evidences of uh, dark matter, additional evidences came afterwards. And uh, a very amazing uh, evidence uh, came uh, applying uh, the principle of gravitational lensing. So this principle is a relatively old principle as uh, thought for the first time by Einstein in the 30s. So the idea of Einstein was that light was affected by gravity. Now, this is pretty much counterintuitive. Um, when I started to study physics, uh, I thought, uh, OK, if you have a massive object, uh, this massive object will feel gravity. Light is carried by photons. Photons are massless. Why do they care about gravity? But in the reality, they do. Okay. So effectively, uh, if you are here, uh, if you are an observer, so if you look at the sky and you look at, uh, for example, a star, a bright star, the star will send you some photons, uh, some light. But this light uh, won't be sent in a direct way if there is a gravitational source in the middle. So if there is, for example, a galaxy in the <coughs> middle. But the light will follow a different path. So the photons uh, will go, for example, in this direction or in this direction and so on and so forth. So they will be bended uh, by the presence uh, of this uh, gravitational source. Okay? But then what happens? Very interesting effect is that we will have two different images of the same object. And the reason is that we can simply take this photon, propagate it, and then we see that we have uh, this uh, an image in a different place. We can have multiple images that look identical, but they are not in the, in the right place. Okay? This is what uh, this uh, gravitational uh, lensing is telling us. And uh, in addition to um, uh, multiple images of the same uh, object, uh, we can also see additional uh, very interesting effects in the sky, as for example, uh, Einstein rings or arcs. So let's see what this animation is telling us. So here we see a gravitational source in the middle, and here we see a star okay, uh, passing by, as we'll see. In white, we see the effect of gravitational lensing, so how we see the light. Um, and in blue, we see simply what would happen if there was no gravitational lensing. Okay? So let's play this video. We see that we are getting closer. Now the light starts bending. And we see this uh, great effect that is this uh, uh, ring, uh, Einstein ring, as we call it. So we can play it again. You see that first you see some arc formed and then some ring. Okay? Now these are really, truly amazing uh, uh, effects that we can see in the sky. Unfortunately, the old idea of Einstein in the 30s, so this is actually an actual paper of Einstein. Einstein told us that there is no way to see this effect. Um, so this is a truly theoretical effect. Maybe we won't, we will never see it. Okay. Actually, so this should tell you that uh, maybe you should not uh, always 100% trust the theorist. And um, probably Einstein also was uh, not thinking about the possible development in technology uh, after uh, after the 30s. Now it's uh, quite remarkable that you can even have an app for your iPhone. You take a picture, you put uh, some uh, gravitational source, and you see how light bends. Okay? So you can download it if you're interested. But beyond this, uh, actually gravitational lensing has been seen in the sky. So we have uh, really amazing uh, uh, pictures like this. This is a galaxy cluster. You see these uh, rings. Seems that everything is concentrical here. So gravitational lensing has been really seen. Okay? And uh, even more amazing is a picture like this. And uh, now what we will do is to make the exercise of uh, trying to understand why this picture is telling us that we have dark matter. Okay? Let's try to understand this. Um, so this is a picture of uh, the sky. Okay? 
Now here in, we see bright sources, uh, so these uh, points here are several you know, stars and galaxies and so on. And this is uh, the way in which you see the sky if you take uh, a very big telescope and you look at uh, the optical. So you look at light that the galaxies and stars are sending you. Okay? Now what are the other colors? And what uh, these other colors are telling us? Okay? So this pinkish color here is telling us where uh, hot gases are. Okay? So this is an image of the sky uh, as taken from X-rays. Okay, so if you have an X-ray telescope, okay? Now you see that these hot gases are uh, mainly uh, focused on two different regions of the sky. And actually, so these are uh, the so-called uh, bullet clusters. So these are two clusters of galaxies that collided something like 100 million ago. Okay, so they were going in opposite direction, they collided, and now they are still going in opposite directions, okay? So you see that uh, these are two clusters of galaxies, and these are this is uh, where the hot gases are of each of the galaxy, oh, of the clusters. Okay. But then uh, let's see what is this blue here. This blue here is something that we obtain with the gravitational lensing, so with this uh, idea of Einstein. Mm -hmm. And this blue uh, is telling us where the most part of matter is, matter that gravitates. So we see that uh, for hot gases, uh, they seem that uh, they got uh, kind of slow down because of this collision. And in fact, hot gases that are formed by standard model particles, the particles that I introduced to you in the first half of this talk, are interacting, interacting through you know, electromagnetism, for example. And because of these interactions, they are simply slow down. You see that they are here, so they are closer to the interaction, to the, to the um, collision. But then you see that we have uh, some other type of matter that doesn't really collide, that, that is not slow down, and uh, as uh, gravitational lensing is telling us. Okay? So basically, since uh, this blue doesn't coincide with pink, uh, this is telling us that uh, the most amount of matter doesn't coincide uh, with the matter uh, that we have discovered, the standard model matter that I discussed with you before. Okay? So this picture alone is considered one of the uh, most important uh, evidences of the presence of dark matter, okay? And it's truly amazing to, uh, to get to know that actually we have even more dark matter than the usual matter. So you can compare the amount of dark matter in your sky to the uh, amount of uh, usual matter, so this, dark, this uh, standard model matter that I discussed, and you see that you have a ratio something like one to five or so. So there is more dark matter than uh, standard model matter, okay? So this is a big mystery because um, we have discovered the amount, uh, some, a lot of matter and we don't really know what it is because it's not contained here. And um, this field, the study of dark matter, is uh, a really challenging and very, very interesting field also because it puts together a lot of different uh, fields in physics. So they are not only particle physicists working on dark matter, but there are people working on gravity and cosmology because we have seen that the you know, evidences of dark matter are coming from gravity. Also, there are astrophysicists that are working in dark matter because we have uh, plenty of information coming from the sky. So it's a truly a uh, big collaboration of uh, completely different scientists that are working trying to understand what the dark matter is. And of course, we have both theorists and experimentalists that are trying to uh, solve this enigma. Now, being a theorist, uh, I have to mention that we have really a lot of theories for dark matter. We are quite creative. Uh, and um, dark matter can be, for example, a heavy neutrino. Uh, dark matter can come in uh, models with extra dimensions, uh, so models in which we don't have only three special dimensions as we are used to, so X, Y, and Z, but we have more than that. Dark, um, dark matter can arise in theories with uh, supersymmetry, and so on and so forth. But in the reality, we have to say that we know only a little about dark matter. Of course, it has to gravitate because we have to produce these uh, huge effects in the sky. Uh, it has to be dark in the sense that it doesn't have to emit uh, light because otherwise we would see it also in the optical. 
And it is stable in the sense that it doesn't behave like a Higgs boson, so it doesn't have to decay to other particles. It is uh, just as it is. Then you can uh, you know, look all these particles that we have discussed so far, or the particles of the standard model, and you can understand that actually none of these particles can be a good uh, dark matter particle. Okay? So it must be something beyond, beyond what we have discovered so far in particle physics. Um, and what is, in my opinion, very much fascinating uh, is that uh, um, um, in the last five or ten years, uh, there have been a lot of attention on theories in which dark matter doesn't come alone, in the sense that the dark matter is in a completely different universe, what we would call a dark universe. So dark matter is not just one particle, but maybe it comes with uh, some cousins, some brothers, and maybe we have also some, what we would call a dark Higgs boson. Maybe we'll have some dark forces like a dark photon or dark fermions. So in principle, there can be a plethora of additional particles that are coming together with dark matter. But then you can say, okay, this theoretically can be nice, can be appealing, but uh, how do we discover something like this? You can think about, uh, you know, two cities. Uh, we live here in the standard model city. That, uh, that is speaking one language. But then uh, the language of this dark universe is a different language. So how do we, how are we able to discover something in the dark city? Okay. And actually, for the last uh, few minutes of this uh, talk, uh, I would like to discuss with you some possible ways uh, to discover or to get uh, hints and to get information on this dark city. And what is truly uh, interesting is that uh, theoretically, we know uh, that the Higgs boson can really cover an essential role uh, for us for discovering the dark city. Now, this goes back to the title of my talk, The Secret Life of the Higgs Boson. Now, theoretically, we think that uh, we know that the Higgs boson is a truly special particle. It, it behaves completely different than uh, any other particle in this uh, cartoon. And the way in which uh, we can think about it uh, uh, in a more direct way is to think about the Higgs boson as a, some, somebody particularly social, okay? Somebody who likes to interact uh, not only with the standard model particles, but maybe also a little bit with the uh, particles of the dark city. So effectively what will happen is that the Higgs uh, will learn a little bit uh, the language of the dark city, say he will learn a little bit uh, Italian, and um, Maybe there is a dark Higgs boson that will learn a little bit of American, right? But then you see that uh, having this Higgs connection will uh, somehow put more together these two cities. And, um, but then, uh, how can we use the LHC? Um, now, we have learned that proton-proton uh, collisions can produce the Higgs boson, plenty of Higgs bosons. We have also learned that the Higgs boson can communicate maybe a little bit this, with this dark universe. And because of this connection, there might be chances for us to produce dark particles at LHC, a few of them. So we really, it will be really amazing in the future maybe to see events like this. So these are actually not real events, but something that I wrote. <laughs> um, so the idea is that actually in the future, we might be able to find uh, different events at LHC um, that is telling us that indeed the Higgs boson of the standard model, what I call here Higgs, a H here, is communicating with dark particles. So maybe the Higgs will even decay to two dark photons, two dark particles. And then we will see some strange events at LHC. Of course, if we will be able to collect many of them, then we'll be able to, to claim the discovery of these uh, dark particles. So this brings me to my conclusions. I'm truly excited uh, that uh, we are having really an exciting journey for particle physics. Uh, after the Higgs boson discovery, particle physics entered the new area. Now we can really use the Higgs boson to probe uh, additional particles and also to learn about dark matter and dark universes. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's been really amazing to see the progress uh, in our understanding of what is fundamental. Everything, you know, started with the uh, air, earth, uh, water and fire, then atoms, then particles, and it would be really exciting to see where we'll go next. Thank you.
a wonderful talk. Um, we definitely have time for questions. Ah, yes. How can the Higgs decay into two separate particles, yet still be considered a fundamental particle? If the definition of fundamental particle is being this. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, so the way in which you can think about it, so first of all, we don't know, we are not sure if uh, the Higgs is fundamental or not. So, so far, we think that it's fundamental, so you cannot break it apart, but uh, we are still trying to understand better and better if this is the case. So I don't exclude uh, that in the future we learn that uh, the Higgs is composite, so it's not fundamental. Uh, but even if it is fundamental, uh, the way in which we can think about uh, this uh, type of decays, so the fact that the Higgs decays to something, is that uh, the Higgs is sort of uh, going to energy, sort of, but from uh, the energy you can uh, produce these particles. So it's not really some, something that is inside the Higgs boson, but it's uh, some, uh, you know, conversion of the Higgs boson in something that is different. Uh, so next Monday we have a pretty special event here about 500 miles north. Mm -hmm. total eclipse, and you brought up uh, the element of the sun. One of the things they'll be studying uh, is the corona of the sun and why the temperature of the corona is uh, a million centigrade compared to the surface of the sun, which is 10,000 centigrade. And one thing, in 2012, there was a, a massive plasma eruption. Fortunately, it didn't come towards our planet where it could have fried some uh, electrical utility plants to the extent of maybe a $2 trillion cost or something. So they're trying to learn more about uh, the plasma flows that leave the sun. Is the Higgs boson present in, in those plasma flows? So I, I can comment on the fact that uh, so the Higgs boson is uh, connected to what we say the weak interactions. Uh, so this uh, W and the Z that uh, we saw before. And the weak interactions are the, the, the interactions that are responsible for letting the sun burning. Okay, so for the, for the reactions that are in the sun. So in this respect, we can think about, uh, you know, the Higgs boson at, um, that is, uh, you know, connected to the electric weak interactions and therefore also connected to the reactions of the sun. That is, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite interesting. And um, yeah, this is a, a very interesting point because I, I didn't really focus much on uh, let me go back, um, on the theory of, uh, of the electroweak interactions, so the theory of these W and DZ bosons. But these are truly uh, important particles because they are responsible of, uh, for example, radioactive decays, so beta decays, or the reactions of in the sun. So these are really, really important particles. And the Higgs is connected to them. Um, so, so far, we don't have really evidences from, uh, uh, from the LHC point of view, right? So the idea, uh, sorry, I need to go back, it, it takes a little bit. <laughs> we have to go through animations again. Um, so this, um, so the idea that the Higgs might be connected to dark matter and to these dark universes is, uh, um, um, quite, uh, a, if you want, a theoretical ideas, simply studying the properties of the Higgs boson, writing down our theory, and seeing if indeed our theories can be uh, consistent with having the Higgs interacting with this dark universe. Um, yeah. Probably in the past there have been uh, some, uh, you know, hints for the existence of uh, a dark universe or a dark sector, but it's not really clear. So this is something that, you know, a very big open question that we would really try to, we would like really to understand better in the coming years. When you, when the scientists collected all of the data to demonstrate the existence of the Higgs boson, and you had the charts that showed all of the imposter right. data, Right, so uh, before the discovery, so theoretically, um, uh, we know the structure of uh, the Higgs uh, particle in the framework of the standard model. 
So the standard model is a quite uh, predictive theory in terms of the behavior of the Higgs boson once that you know the Higgs boson mass. So the standard model itself is not telling us what is the mass, but uh, can tell us anything else. So once that you fix the mass, you know everything about the Higgs boson. We didn't know the mass, so we had to, you know, in principle, the mass could have been anywhere, okay? But once that you fix the mass, you know how large this bump should have been from the standard model. So, of course, the challenge was to collect the data in such a way to, you know, populate uh, all the possible masses and see where the Higgs boson was. Um, that, so the question is, uh, so let me maybe repeat the question. So the question is uh, if uh, maybe we are looking uh, at this problem in a, in a wrong way and maybe there is not this dark universe. Is that the question? So as I wanted to argue, we know the existence of dark matter in the sense that we know about this phenomena that cannot be really explained in the framework of the standard model, right? And uh, so sort of uh, we know that uh, there should be something that gravitates that uh, introduce these effects in the sky, okay? Now probably the, the, the idea that is uh, most, uh, you know, believed is this existence of dark matter. There are other solutions to this problem in the sky like, a gravi like a modified gravity, but they usually don't work that well. Certainly not as well as the idea of dark matter. So all this, uh, Everything that we have seen in the sky seems to point us uh, towards the existence of dark matter. So at least this dot here should be pretty, you know, uh, um, understood, at least the existence. Of course, the, the really broad and, and uh, important question is what is dark matter, right? Because at this level, it can be really uh, a lot of different particles. It can have uh, very many different masses, for example. And uh, it's a truly a, a real challenge, uh, experimentally and theoretically, to really understand what it is. The idea of having a dark universe is uh, somehow one of the ideas for uh, writing down our theories of dark matter. And, uh, and this is an important idea that should be tested uh, in the coming years by, by several experiments. For, the, you know, for this talk, I mentioned only the Large Hadron Collider, but actually we have many experiments with this goal. And I think it will be a very important result, uh, result if we are able to discover, uh, you know, from the particle physics point of view, what the dark matter is and what the dark universe is, or also to rule out our ideas uh, of a dark universe. It will be uh, invaluable, I think. The LHC has been running several years since the discovery of the Higgs. Uh, has anything else been discovered or what, are, what things are being looked for? Um, so, so the question is, uh, what, um, if we had other discoveries at LHC beyond the Higgs boson and what we are looking for? So I'm repeating for. Um, so uh, in terms of discovery, so in terms of what we are looking for is uh, a very broad question because uh, so basically, this Atlas and CMS experiment uh, are looking broadly for a really huge set of uh, new particles. So particles not belonging to the standard model. So there are many, many searches for uh, new particles, and so far we didn't uh, discover any of them. Okay. In addition, there is a completely different, uh, uh, you know, uh, field, uh, a different, a completely different direction for the Large Hadron Collider that is basically measuring very, very accurately uh, the behavior of the particles that we already know the existence of. So for example, for the Higgs boson, um, of course, uh, it has been amazing uh, to discover this particle, but uh, it's also amazing that we are going towards uh, a program of precision measurements, as we say. So we will get to know the behavior of this Higgs boson better and better. And, uh, and DLHC will cover a very important role uh, in this, uh, uh, for, for this aim of measuring the behavior of the Higgs boson. Um, yeah, I hope it answered to your question. <laughs> 
<coughs> How does this standard model table account for virtual particles? Um, so you can think about uh, um, virtual particles as uh, particles that you, since they are visual, you don't really see with your uh, Large Hadron Collider. Um, so virtual particles are really essential when you do calculations in uh, theoretical particle physics uh, because you could think about virtual particles as uh, particles that are exchanged uh, between real particles uh, in such a way to mediate interactions. Okay. So for example, you can think about uh, you know, the, the interaction between two electrons uh, as mediated by a virtual photon that you don't really see but is the responsible of the fact that the electrons will uh, repel each other. Yeah, so the question is how to see dark matter at LHC. Um, so, um, yeah, actually, I could have given uh, a, you know, a physics talk just about that. <laughs> but um, so um, the idea is, uh, so if you see here, even in the standard model, we have the so-called uh, neutrinos uh, that are uh, basically not really much interacting with the other particles. And neutrinos uh, were seen uh, basically like, as we say, missing energy. So if you have a reaction that is producing neutrinos, we know that uh, you have conservation of energy of your system, right? If you have something that escapes uh, that you don't see, but then you can see it in indirectly because you have some missing energy, something that you don't see, okay? And similarly, the idea is if you, uh, you know, create dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider, Maybe you will see some proton-proton uh, collision with some missing energy uh, that, uh, uh, with, with some particle that is escaping and therefore producing missing energy. So this is uh, the, you know, the main idea of how to see uh, dark matter at LHC. Um, so you see, um, so, so the question is in 20 years, uh, uh, if I have to give uh, a, a public lecture here in Aspen, what I will uh, tell you, uh, so certainly in 20 years we'll have a much, much better understanding of the Higgs boson. Because uh, something that I really don't, didn't mention for this talk, uh, is that, uh, so the idea is to measure the Higgs boson, so to understand how the Higgs boson decays, uh, how it is produced and so on, in a very, very precise manner. And this is something that, he, that uh, we have as a goal uh, of for the coming uh, yeah, decade, at least at the Large Hadron Collider, that we continue running, uh, okay? So certainly, uh, we'll know much, much more about the Higgs boson uh, if compared to what we know now. Um, additionally, um, so I, I just, uh, you know, mentioned a few topics, but uh, there will be many more topics that I could mention. So additionally, I'm fully convinced that for this uh, idea of dark matter and dark universes, there will be much, much more information. The information, of course, can go in both directions, can go in the direction of a discovery. So maybe in 20 years, we will be here telling the, the full, uh, if you want, story of dark matter, telling what dark matter is, what particle it is or maybe if there are other particles in this dark universe, or maybe we'll tell that we have, uh, we know that the dark matter um, doesn't behave as we thought it was behaving from the particle physics point of view. So we'll have certainly much, much more information, and this information will come not only from the Large Hadron Collider that is the main topic of this talk, but also from many other different experiments. So there are many different ways of or looking for dark matter beyond the LHC. So we learn uh, definitely, definitely much more, certainly on these two topics of Higgs and dark matter. Then if you want to you know, be even broader, we'll know a lot more about the neutrinos, for example. This is completely beyond uh, you know, the talk of today, but we'll know that we'll know much more about the neutrinos. So there will be a lot of sectors uh, 
both in the standard model and beyond that we'll know better in the next, uh, if you want, a decade or two. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? I could not. Uh, Since the Higgs particle is the result of a proton proton collision, mm -hmm. is the particle itself contained within protons or is it created from the results of that collision? And if so, what particles is it created from? Yeah, so the, 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 um, the way of understanding how to produce uh, Higgs bosons from proton proton collisions. Uh, um, let me go back just a second. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, indeed we have proton-proton collisions uh, with a very, very high energy. So these collisions here carry a lot of energy. So you don't have just to think about protons, but you have really mainly to think about energy. So we have some energy that is, uh, as we said, 7,000 7, bigger than the mass of the proton. And from this energy, the idea is that we can convert uh, uh, energy to mass and vice versa, and therefore from energy we can create uh, uh, Higgs bosons. This is the, the idea. And uh, we're using protons because we know that experimentally we can accelerate them really, really quickly and produce a lot of energy. Uh, but in principle we could also use uh, different particles. The idea is just to, to go to very high energies in such a way to produce a Higgs boson.